And now that, that the popularity is rising, not only in the UK but also uh, uh, in Europe and America, is this like, because uh, you had, had this dream and now it's real, mm. what, what, is, what does this do for you? Well, you kind of, you always imagine these things happening, getting on a tour bus, playing a huge festival, selling however many singles, but you can't really picture you it. Can't, it's hard to take in when it comes because it feels like, well, is this is this it? Is, is this, this real? Is this real? Is this what I've been imagining, or is this? I don't know. That sounds kind of. I think it's weird for us though because negative. it's like because if you put if you told the seventeen year old me and George if you put us here now and explain to us the year we've had and we would be go, what? But because everything happens in such small stages, you know, you get your first bit of publicity, yeah, and, and it, it all builds. Feels... You don't go from nothing to Glastonbury. Mm. You live that. Yeah, and it feels. But do you still have these moments that you think, oh, oh we're yeah, totally, every day, every day we sing, we laugh, like when we got on this tour bus, we're still like, we've been on tour buses for a while now this year, but as soon as we, when we ever get a new tour bus or we turn up to a gig it and there's kids outside, us, we're just like, we're hey, discovering, so discovering the bus every yeah. time, like we what's, so, what's in this one Exactly, now? we get yeah. so excited by everything and we're so humbled that we've got the opportunity to do this and a lot of the time we can't really believe that there's job. so much demand for our band. Because we're kind of like, we've always known that, but we're so amazed that everybody else knows it now. And how important are, are your fans for you? Oh, the most, that's it. That's everything. That's everything. What, what, what is the, the, a good memory of, uh, about a fan that did something or said one, something? Oh, well, we got an amazing letter. We got a really day. nice letter the other day about a girl who had befriended another girl on the internet over her love for our band which can sometimes be a bit odd, friend. but apparently these two immediately started Skyping with one another and then became very, very close friends, really close friends, through us, through our band. That means a lot. And then when we were a lot smaller back in the UK, like January, a couple came up to me at a gig in London and said that they'd fallen in love with each other through our EP, the sex EP. They'd started speaking about it when they were out with a group of friends. They were friends with other people. And they'd met and said, you know, this band in 1975. And they fell in love with that record and now they're getting engaged. And I love that. It nearly made me cry because I was like, well, that's it. That's it. That's all, that's all we want to do for it to affect people emotionally. I mean, if you have an artistic expression that does that, there's nothing more beautiful, really. And I think if that's your job, like if that's your job, like how can you how can you get any better than that? I don't think you can get any better than being in a proper band. Um, about the about the band name, you change names quite a lot with mm -hmm. the, with the band. Um, can you just take me through why you change the name so often? Well, I mean, people talk about the name changes a lot, mm -hmm. but because people are interested in our band now. Yeah, it wasn't people weren't interested in our bands when we were changing all the names, so we're kind of like, why do you want to talk about it? It wasn't, it was loads of things. Started out, our first name was with us since we were 16. So when you get to 19, you think, that's not really us. So we changed to Big Sleep. We thought, this is quite a cool name. And then we signed a record deal in America, a small one, and they said, you know there's an American band called The Big Sleep? And we were like, oh, I didn't know that. But at this time, remember, no one knew who we were. We didn't even really know who we were, so we didn't really care. So we were like, oh, let's change the name again, that'll be fun. So we did that to the slowdown, and then we wait a couple of months, we did a video, we were like, oh, I don't like that name. But, but, and then people were kind of like, you can't change your name all the time. We were like, why, do you care? There's only like about 2,000 people who know the band. So we did that. But the 1975 is our name, and it's not a name that's come around because we couldn't find any other names. That is the definitive name. And once we decided on that, we did the Face Down EP, and it just... We were and why this name? Where, where does 1975 come from? 1975, it it's, it's just this story in the UK. It's been very idealised, because I think people love a good story. But it comes from, I was on holiday, long story short, I was on holiday in Mallorca, and with my family, I wasn't like being a student going to find myself or anything. It was just a holiday that you have with your parents. And there was an artist who lived in the village who was kind of a local drinker who befriended everybody. And I spent a couple of days with him at his house and he gave me loads of literature to leave with. 
and it was all kind of Jack Kerouac and beat poetry and basically one of the books he gave me had been treated as a diary by a previous owner with scribblings across all the pages, odd things um, and they had dated the book 1st of June, THE 1975 and when I saw THE 1975 I'd never seen that, that, that use of language, a kind of uh, uh, it, wrong, really, grammatically incorrect use of the word the. You don't get that very often. And it, it wasn't like, oh, that's the name of my band now. It was just something that stuck in my head. And every time I saw the word the... Or what, the word, what feeling did you get when you read it first? It was kind of a bit haunting. It wasn't haunting because I suppose like, the, the, the notes and stuff weren't suicidal. They were just odd. They would jump from first to third person. So it, it just stuck with me as a kind of why. Why the night? And maybe also the mystery about this person. Exactly, the mystery about who they were, what they were, what they were feeling, and why, what made them write the 1975. I don't know, but I think it really works with the fact that we were discovering a lot about ourselves, and we weren't really sure about who we were, and we'd gone through writing, finding loads of different names, this kind of thing. And the 1975, I was just like, do you remember that when I told you about that? And everybody was like, oh yeah. Did you, what did you think in, the, in this, this moment that he came with the name? Um, yeah, I always said initially that I thought it looked amazing written down, but it might have been too long. Yeah, because it's but the that, 1975, seven, seven, seven syllables, syllable yeah. band name. Mm -hmm. And then basically we had... Did you have any other suggestions? Oh, or? we did loads, but... Oh yeah, we had, I don't know, like, oh, just... So we had like a board of words, <laughs> of our favourite <laughs> words. One, it. Yeah, it got to a pretty, it digressed <laughs> in terms of the process of selection. But yeah. Do you remember some weird ones or some, uh, some funny ones? We had like Talk House for we about five minutes. We had Talk House for five minutes, like, and uh, like... Um, none of them, they were all, they were, none of them were genuine. And that was, even Big Sleep, like, it was a great name. It had, it had a nice feeling to it. Uh, but it was slightly too dark, I guess. And, and even that and the slowdown, none of them really had a genuine reason. I mean, no band name really means that. And once a band Some, name becomes yeah. a band name, it's like that Pavlovian reaction, it you know? It's, it's just instantly there. Instantly detached from You don't reality, think so. of the colour pink when you hear Pink Floyd, for example. You don't think of a, a stone when you hear the Rolling Stones. So I think eventually people will... It's difficult with the year, but I think when we went in for a label meeting, when we went in for a meeting with our publisher, and we've always liked to pitch things left of centre. We said, we're going to call the band the 1975. They said, absolutely no way can you call the band the 1975. There's never been... Because it was, it, it was too long. Too they long. said it's too long and there's never been a big band that's just been numbers. And then we looked at each other like, that's the name. <laughs> so I went and got it tattooed on my arm that day. So now you can change it anymore. Oh, no, I sent, <laughs> I sent them a photo of that, like, that's the name of the band now. As soon as they said there's never been a big band with its just numbers, we thought, Yeah, because we said, well, we didn't say we were going to be big, so... Exactly. We just said that we we're going to be big. Exactly. Yeah. Shot yourself in the foot. And you like to pitch things off-center, you said? Well, I think that's the main thing with our band, especially, like, we love pop music. We grew up listening to pop music, like, black American soul music and pop music. And I think with all pop music is... I think with all art, for me, what we really like with our band is that there's a big juxtaposition in regards to our sound and our aesthetic. Like, our, our music really is very major. If we're talking about it technically, it's very major. It's very life-affirming. It's very grandeur and, I suppose, quite feel-good. So we like to juxtapose that with an aesthetic that's maybe a bit more dour, maybe a bit more... A bit darker, not for the sake of wanting to be cool or dark. I think that we find a lot of solace in everything being black and white and detached from reality because there is so much of ourselves in our music and there's so much self-deprecation and self-awareness and laying ourselves bare that I think we like the comfort of everything that people see being a bit detached from reality so we're not fully exposed. Yeah, you, like even initially we kind of, we always questioned whether it was coherent enough across the music and the aesthetic but as soon as you you put it out and you give it to people they make it completely them, themselves people fill in the dots you know people like to people like to understand something more people will always be more willing to give you the benefit of the doubt if your music makes you feel good they'll change what they think is cool if your music's good enough 
So I think people really give us the benefit of the doubt. And is that is that also why you uh, lyrically uh, n not tell a story from A to C, but but leave leave out certain bits for people to fill in? This yeah, is the exactly. thing. People aren't idiots. Like the majority of most industries treat their demographic as if they're idiots. Uh, we want quite a strict door policy on our band. We don't want idiots getting in. And I think that Not it's that we'll ever try and enforce. <laughs> no, we'll ever try and enforce that. But it's kind of like a cool police. You've got to give people the benefit of the doubt because then they're going to invest in it and they're going to feel that. Like I don't. We paint pictures with our music, but we don't tell people anything. That's for you. It's like Mark Knopfler. I had the honour of meeting Mark Knopfler a couple of times, and I remember saying to him, like Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits. That's about war, isn't it? And he, in such a rock star way, he just sat there and he just went if you want it to be. And I was kind of like, that's either the most cliched thing anybody's ever said to me, or it's genius. Because even that song that is so obviously about war, it doesn't have to be. At the risk of sounding pretentious, like I genuinely think once you've written a song, it's not really yours anymore. It's like when, you, when you're studying literature at school, if you do an exam and you pick apart a, a poem or something in a certain way it's not right or wrong exactly it's really basic it's way all subjective it. and it's all interpretation and we've learned a lot more about our music and who we are as people and who i am as a lyricist through the reaction yeah, that we've since, had from people since in the past can, can you name a lesson you learned or, or well no what i mean you, by that i mean, mean, mean just grow well yeah a... i mean it's basically We've been a band for 10 years, mm -hmm. so we've we've always been very familiar with our music. We understand it 100%. For like eight years of that. For eight years of that, no one's heard it. Just intrinsic. Yeah, exactly. It was just for us. It was like a private club. So once in August of last year, all this music of which we knew so much about and we'd invested so much in, once that became open for interpretation, so many people start expressing what they think the songs may be about. And then you go. And then it, it's, even maybe if it it's, is. Even if it's a conscious decision or not, you kind of, you kind of keep that in mind. Exactly, and you think, well, is it about that? Maybe it is about that, and it's catalyzed a real progression in our understanding of who we are and what we want to achieve and what we are actually saying. Because once you say something, you create something. You think, yeah, that's great. But once it's out there and you're seeing it being, it has a, a process of validation amongst people it becomes a lot more visible and you can see it a lot more.